you so much for uh, taking the time to speak with us here. Um, we were hoping to start things off. If you could just give a really brief um, little background on yourself. And uh, for instance, um, you were here a couple of years ago, I know, talking about your book. But before we get into that, um, if you could just give a little bit of background on um, really from from Rhodes up into where you are now would be great. Yeah. So um, I went to Rhodes um, under very little choice of my own. My dad taught there and I got free tuition and it was around the corner from my parents' house. So um, so it was, it was uh, but it wound up being a, a great place for me. Um, I, uh, like probably a lot of college kids, midway through college felt very lost and confused and had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I took a semester off and wound up doing an internship for the Memphis Business Journal that then turned into a job for the Memphis Business Journal, which then turned into um, an opportunity to move out to Silicon Valley and work for the San Jose Business Journal um, in 1999, which was the you know peak of the dot com boom when you know Silicon Valley was the most exciting place to be. And I had been covering finance at the Memphis Business Journal and really fell in love with sort of startups and venture capital and you know the opportunity to go where it was the epicenter of it, even though I was working for a very tiny publication. Um, was just an amazing, amazing opportunity and one that I'm really happy in retrospect that I grabbed with both arms because there was a ton of people that I knew who graduated in 98, 99 to this like crazy job market and people just thought, well, I'm not totally ready to do that. Like it'll still be raging in a few years and I feel like I was lucky enough to sort of, you know, get here when things were still manic and experience, um, and experience it. Um, and fortunately, hold on to a job, um, which you know was was amazing timing and luck. Um, so then uh, everything crashed. I worked at the Business Journal for a few more years, and then went to Business Week. Um, I think it was the first hire Business Week had made in their San Francisco bureau in five years because everything had been very decimated in the media out here. Um, I worked at Business Week for about three years. Um, I did a cover on uh, the rise of the consumer internet again in Web 2.0, which was one of the first big national magazine covers about Facebook and Dig and LinkedIn and, and Yelp and YouTube and a lot of those companies. Um, that turned into a book deal, so I quit Business Week to write my first book. Um, and then I did a host of things. I hosted a show for Yahoo Finance. Um, I wrote a second book about entrepreneurship and emerging markets. Um, that I traveled for about 40 weeks through China, India, South America, and Africa for. And um, then I wound up at TechCrunch, um, I guess when the company was about three years old, and worked there sort of part-time when I was doing my second book, and then full-time helping them, you know, hopefully take what was then a $20, $30 million media company to be a $100 million media company, but unfortunately Mike decided to sell it before we got to that point. Um, I worked there for about a year and then um, was supposed to take over as editor-in-chief and then when I was giving birth to my first kid, uh, they, Mike blew up with Ariana, they kicked him out of the company, they gave someone else the job while I was in labor in the hospital. So I came home and decided to start my own company and so that was three years ago. I took my newborn, I didn't have a nanny or anything. I took my newborn baby fundraising with me, raised two and a half million dollars, and started Pando three years ago. Wow, quite the story there. Yeah, it's been an eventful 15 years or so. <laughs> Great, so um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, either one of the books that you wrote and kind of, you're an English major at Rhodes, was mm -hmm. that a huge part of writing those books? Um, how much did your major affect what you ended up doing later in life? You know, I think it affected it a lot. I mean, when I, so English was one of the things that I AP'd out of because I'd always done really well at it in high school. So it was one of the only classes that I didn't take my first, you know, say three semesters at Rhodes. And I started out actually majoring in international studies. And I just kind of realized, like, I don't know, a semester or so into it, like, um, no offense if anyone there is an international studies major, but I didn't really like the people in my classes. <laughs> I felt like if these are the people I was going to be working with in an industry, that wasn't a great sign. Um, but And I found what I really missed was studying and tearing apart and digesting literature. So I had no idea what I was going to do with that career-wise, but I thought that's really sort of where my heart was and what I missed. Um, 
more so that really than writing. It was really just sort of the being able to digest and um, pick apart and see, read between the lines and see meanings behind things. Like that was what I really loved about it. And I think that really did prepare me to be a journalist more than going to journalism school would have. Um, because a lot of what I'm trying to do um, is see the truth behind what people are telling me, particularly as a business reporter, because things we write regularly affects millions, if not billions of dollars of market value for companies. Um, so everyone's lying to us. Like, that's just their incentive. So it's like being able to sort of, you know, see behind that and pull threads together is really, really valuable. And I think I got a lot of that from literature. Um, I think also, um, obviously being able to structure an argument and all that is very important. Um, but, you know, I feel like um, the personalities like behind these companies and figuring out what makes them tick, I mean, that's a similar thing of, of when you're sort of trying to decode um, a novel. Um, so I think all of that was really valuable. And then it's funny, particularly with my second book, which was about emerging markets, you know, I, it, it almost was like a fusion of sort of that, you know, two years of being an international studies major and then um, you know and then also being a, an English literature major and it was crazy that I just wound up doing something that that was so international and really I had never traveled internationally because you know my parents were both teachers I was the youngest of five kids like I grew up and we had no money for anything like that um, you know I was not lucky enough to do be able to do a semester abroad when I was at Rhodes um, and then, you know, I went into the workforce and I was a reporter and most people know reporters don't really make a lot of money and you have like two weeks of vacation. And so the great thing about that book was I felt like I had seen this huge shift in money go, you know, no venture capitalist in the Valley ever wanting to invest in anything outside of like a day's drive or a half hour flight to huge amounts of money, billions of dollars being sent to some of the biggest emerging markets in the world. And like, it's a very uncomfortable transaction to do if you're a venture capitalist because you'd like to be able to like know what you're investing in. And so there's no reason they would be doing it if it weren't an outsized market opportunity to investing in the Valley. So I was fascinated by that trail of money, but I'd never really written about it in the 10 years I'd been in the Valley because I felt like I'm such a believer in on the ground reporting. And so I was like, if I'm going to do it, I need to do it right. So I sort of pitched this ridiculous book, which was me spending 40 weeks, you know, about six weeks in each country. Um, and just going places where they'd never heard of me or TechCrunch and didn't read Business Week, and um, you know, frequently trying to hunt down uh, entrepreneurs who are building things for those big markets, not being super Western facing. So that involves spending a lot of times in like slums and villages in sort of these crazy chaotic cities where I didn't speak the language and didn't know anybody, and so it was sort of a crazy project. But I will say I was at times glad that I'd take that horrible international studies exam where you have to, with like 90% accuracy, identify every country and where it is in the world. <laughs> oh, valuable in Africa. <laughs> gotcha. So obviously you're a pretty stellar example of how uh, a liberal arts education can let you do something really eclectic in life. What would you say uh, the importance of a liberal arts education versus maybe something that's a bit more focused is um, to the students of today? Well, I just think all industries are changing so rapidly. I mean, who would have thought a couple years ago that transportation would be a sexy industry? And yet, highest valued private company in Silicon Valley is Uber, a transportation company. I mean, everything is getting completely remade. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of people building these companies are people with liberal arts educations. I mean, uh, Chad Dickerson, who's the head of Etsy, is a big believer in liberal arts education and had one. Um, last week, I just interviewed uh, Stuart Butterfield, who's the head of Slack, billion-dollar company. He was a philosophy major. Um, I think Peter Thiel was a philosophy major. I always remember the philosophy majors. So my dad taught philosophy. Um, but, uh, you know, I know more... If, if they're not sort of math-based engineers. I know more billion-dollar CEOs and founders in the Valley who have liberal arts education than not. And I think there's a couple reasons why. One is because these industries are changing so quickly that if you, you know, study to be a lawyer or study to be something, like even, even go to journalism school, do something that is very vocational-based, you know, you're kind of pigeonholed in that. Whereas if you have a liberal arts degree, you know how to communicate with people you know how to structure things, you know how to write. I mean, I'll give a 
great example. Um, you know, Katie Stanton, who I know is also sort of very close to the Rhodes heart, she just wrote a beautiful piece in, on Medium over the weekend about this horrible experience she had going to the Crunchies and this like outrageous like sexism that pervaded it. Now, one of the reasons that her her view on this event got so much attention and like so much press is because she was able to write a really beautiful piece expressing herself. I mean, just being able to write in your own words and express yourself right now in an age of personal brand and blogging and social media is so vital. Like CEOs and investors who can do that are dramatically ahead of the game, whereas 10 years ago that wasn't even something they'd be allowed to do. I mean, right. there you know, and, and it's and frankly, if you're going to start a company, it's I mean, there you just need to know how to do everything. I mean, there are things that I'm doing running Pando that I never thought I would be doing, and there's different ways that you draw on all those skills. So, like, the more weapons you can put in a toolbox, the better. I mean, I remember when I took a semester off roads, and I was uh, doing a, I was applying for a nanny job, and I was, um, and it was, you know. For a college kid it was gonna be a really well-paying nanny job, and so like it was competitive, and I really wanted to get it. And there was gonna be travel, and I thought it would be really great. And um, and I remember going in, and the reason I got the job was because the the guy was this big classical music uh, teacher, and I went in, and he was listening to NPR, and like Schubert's Unfinished Symphony was playing, and he was like, "Oh, there's some nice Brahms playing," and I was like, "Actually, I think that's Schubert," and like. <laughs> The entire reason I got the job, and it's like you know, you just never know when having a base knowledge that tells you a a little bit about a lot of different things and being well read and able to speak and argue and articulate and write, like those are just skills. It's hard for me to think of a time that wouldn't help you. Like my sister's a French teacher, and I was thinking about putting my kids in Chinese immersion school, and it was like the biggest family scandal we've ever had because she was just like, I will disown you. She's like. So upset about like French getting run out of school in favor of Chinese. Uh -huh. you, this is just like Arabic a few years ago, and then Japanese before that. And I was like, okay, first of all, it's not the Chinese. You know, it's a larger population, and like they will, you know, that's going to be the largest economy for quite a while. That said, I can't think of a time that I would be mad if I taught my kids to learn Arabic or Japanese either. I mean, I, you know, I just think anything learning languages, you know. It, Art, culture, reading, arguing, like these are all things that shape your brain in a certain way. And you just have no like you're if you're doing sales, if you're doing like anything in the business world, you just never know when one of these things is gonna be an asset. And if you're trying to raise money, if you're trying to sell to someone, if you're trying to get a foot in the door, like any of these things can help you. So like why not master all of them? Whereas if I had gone to school with like a journalism degree, like okay, I know how to write an AP style, and I would have worked in you know a boring mid-market newsroom covering school board meetings. That would have helped me none. So uh, Yahoo's a female CEO is finally getting some credit for the job she's done, starting to turn Yahoo around. But I mean, it's not been an easy one. And uh, having been in the field for so long, do you think that? the uh, technology field is definitively resistive towards women? Has this changed, or is it still as big of a problem as it was 10 years ago? So there's not an easy answer to this. I mean, I think before we even get into the into tech, we need to acknowledge that pretty much every industry is really hard for women. And I feel like because tech is a very sexy field right now, and because there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of money, people always want to point to tech. But like, I think the Silicon Valley is way more welcoming to women than like Wall Street or even, you know, the entertainment industry. I mean, if you look at, you know, or even like, it's, it's amazing. You think of industries where women should have every advantage because women are either the customer or they fit into a stereotype of women, like chefs, fashion designers. These are all male-dominated industries when you actually talk about CEOs and top designers and top chefs. So I think the entire world, the entire business world is basically tilted against women. And it's like, you know, people overstate the tech element and what they're seeing in tech is really just a function of being a woman in this world. And there are far worse places in tech. Government, finance, I mean, things that are more hierarchical, I think, are in general way harder. So that having been said, though, I think the issue with tech is there's never been 
And this is what's so weird about it right now. There's never been more opportunities for women in the startup world and in Silicon Valley than there have been right now. Um, so I guess to continue on that tack with maybe another uh, sometimes overlooked or disadvantaged population, college students. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to starting a business or really any type of organization, on one hand, as a college kid, you have a ton of free time and you have very low cost of living, mm -hmm. but also you really don't have the type of access to capital um, or experience that um, older adults may have. So do you think college is a good time to start a business? Well, you know, I do think there's always this sort of sex appeal to the young college dropout or 22-year-old, you know, brilliant founder who sees the world a different way and, you know, has, you know, a low personal burn rate and has all the hours in the world to plug away at something. And so I think it's, like, that's the group that is the more likely group to get fun bummer as had in recent years. Now, that said, it's still really, really hard. I mean, you're way better off doing that at Stanford than doing that at Rhodes or basically any other school other than Stanford. You sure. still have connections to have access to capital. You have to have a great idea. You have to be, you know, extraordinary because it's hard enough to build a company when you've had, you know, 15 years of professional, uh, you know, advice and contact and mentors and everything else. But I think in terms of just you know, optic, like the world likes backing 22-year-olds more than it likes backing 42-year-olds. So, you know, Silicon Valley obviously has some very different viewpoints as a city, as a uh, group of investors when it, you know, from Memphis when it comes to building businesses and where uh, value and potential is in a business. And so, you know, for instance, in uh, out in San Francisco, so there are plenty of companies that are founded at really the concept stage or at the pre-revenue stage that maybe have a bunch of users and traction um, and but don't necessarily have a fully proven out revenue model. Now, on the flip side in Memphis, um, you know, you can you can go to a group of Memphis investors with a million daily users and they say, well, yeah, but how much money are you making? And uh, really, there's a huge flip in mentalities uh, going from Memphis to Silicon Valley. Um, number one, where do you stand on that spectrum? And also, if you're someone who is, uh, for instance, a college kid in Memphis trying to build some type of user-based website, for instance, that doesn't have uh, a good revenue stream at the moment, how can you go about building your idea? Yeah, you just have to move. I mean, that is a very specific Silicon <laughs> Valley playbook, and it only works here. I mean, the same way if you wanted to make Oscar movies, you should move to Hollywood. If you want to be you know, work on Wall Street and do IPOs, you should move to New York. If you want to be in magazine publishing, you should move to New York. If you want to be major in, like, advertising, you should move to New York. Like, it's astounding to me how many people, you never hear people saying, well, where's the next Hollywood? Well, like, there have been a couple, there's good film talent in Omaha. Why can't Omaha be the next Hollywood? But somehow everyone thinks there should be a place that does what Silicon Valley does. Like, no, it's a company town. This is what it does. It does it well. It has people who understand how to do it. It has people who are comfortable investing in companies with those type of dynamics. More important, it has people who are comfortable working for companies with those type of dynamics. And it has a built-in support system because it's really, really hard and you're probably going to fail. And socially, that's a difficult thing to go through and it's a lot easier to go through here. So it's not to say no one can do it in another part of, of the country or another part of the world. There's certainly examples of it. But, you know, there's a reason that the bulk of them come out of Silicon Valley and the bigger the industry's gotten and the more varied it's gotten, the concentration continues to be even greater in Silicon Valley. If you want to build a consumer-based, we are going to go for eyeballs first and revenues later business, you, you would be crazy not to do it here because so many things are going to go wrong if you can de-risk one part of it by where you live, why would you not do that? Like, why would you not do that? It, you just have to. Now, if you're building any other different company, there's lots of places you can go. If you're going to build an enterprise company, you know, you can, you know, Chicago has a ton of enterprise companies. I mean, there's a lot of, Atlanta has some, you know, great companies that are enterprise companies. There's, you know, certainly if you're going to go into healthcare, I mean, Nashville has amazing companies around healthcare. You know, there's a lot of other sectors where there are great centers of, you know, concentration in the U.S. I mean, if you're going to do something around sort of mobile storytelling, like arguably you should go to L.A. and not, 
you know, the Valley. Because, like, that's booming in L.A. right now. If you're going to do something around ad tech, you should go to New York. Like, it's not to say every high-growth startup in the tech space needs to be done out of cons out of Silicon Valley. But if you're going to, if you want to do the consumer internet playbook, there's just no other place where it works. Because it's like, you are basically, you do have a business model when you are an early stage consumer revenue, uh, consumer internet company. Your business model is you are selling shares to venture capitalists for huge amounts of money. And there is, those customers only all exist in one place. And so why would you not go there? It just doesn't make any sense. And I know that's like a bummer and like, look, I love Memphis and like I love the South and you know, there's a lot of things about San Francisco that piss me off and like I've been here since 99 and if I sit next to someone on a plane and they say, where are you from? I still say Memphis. I don't say San Francisco. I don't know if that'll ever change, you know? But that said, it, it is just the reality of the game. There's just so many variables and if you can like, you take so many off the table by being here and it's like, just pick up and move. If it doesn't work, move in three years. The other thing is if you fail, there's a million places to hire you. Like everyone is hiring and everyone is trying to find people. So it's like the risk of failure is so much less. If you convince people to quit jobs and work for you and you fail, they can get other jobs. So you don't have that pressure as much. I mean, it's just way easier. To you, the first part of your question about like fundraising and all that, um, I had a really interesting experience where I raised my first round in Silicon Valley and raised it from, you know, people like, you know, Reed Hoffman and Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen and Jim Breyer and, you know, sort of the big classic Silicon Valley names. Right. Um, second round was led by Lara Ventures in New York, um, who were the guys who built Huffington Post and had a lot of really great media experience. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up raising my next round, which was, um, which was uh, led out of a group in Tennessee. And um, so I've raised money in all three places. And it's, I mean, same company, way more revenue, way more traction, way more to show for, you know, in, in Tennessee than we did anywhere else and in New York that I had in Silicon Valley. Hands down, easiest money, best terms in Silicon Valley. It's just a totally different ballgame, even versus New York. And, like, if I didn't already have the traction that I had with Pando, the revenues, because we actually do have a really good revenue stream and like we'll get profitable on four million dollars. So we had an easier story for like a Tennessee investor than, you know, certainly a normal consumer internet company would. And, you know, I had track record for sort of helping build TechCrunch and having that experience before. Um, and we had the investors that we had. If I and it was still took me more time to raise a less amount of money in the South than anywhere else. And if I had not had those things, we would have never gotten funded. And frankly, I probably would have had an even harder time raising money as a woman. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, well, that was a, a really good answer. Because uh, well, right now in Memphis, there's a, a push by um, a small one, but a growing one, to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Memphis. And it, uh, I'm uh, been kind of smack in the middle of it, and uh, it seems like it's kind of struggling to identify itself with is it is it going to try and support these kind of sexier consumer facing things that you see coming out of the valley that uh, I think a lot of interest from potential founders exists here in Memphis like it probably does in the rest of the world everyone wants to build an app um, or does it need to go more the route of uh, an incubator or an environment for you know logistics based companies because we have FedEx here and it's just not possible to build a we just don't have the infrastructure and never will to build a uh, ecosystem that can support consumer facing stuff. I mean it is possible. Anything is possible. And it's like you're asking an ecosystem question, but ecosystems are made up of individuals. And every individual needs to do the best thing for them, not their ecosystem or anything else. So it's like if the best thing for you is moving to San Francisco, I mean it certainly was for me. There's no way in hell I would have built a company if I had stayed in Memphis. Like it, it just it, for a media company, like what would I have done? It just wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have had the inspiration, the mentorship. There wouldn't have been the market opportunity that I saw in building Pando. So for someone like me, you know, I wouldn't have been an entrepreneur if I had stayed in Memphis. Um, you know, and now, I mean, yes, I'm building a company in Silicon Valley, but we do our big annual event um, in Nashville where we bring, you know, hundreds of VCs and investors and tons of people to the state of Tennessee. So I would argue I do more to support Tennessee investors having left and gone to Silicon Valley than I ever would have done if I had stayed. So like for me that was for someone else who has like, 
you know, elderly parents in Tennessee or kids in school and like can't move, they should try to do it there because like it's all possible and success is all relative. Like what people consider success in Silicon Valley, you know, you know, you right now you have to be, you know, it's even becoming passe to only be a billion dollar company. But like there's tons of people I know in Nashville, Atlanta, you know, Raleigh, plenty of other smaller cities who, who, you know, they sell a company for fifty million dollars, like, you know, they are like the BSD in the room. Like that's an amazing success. So like that's very doable. It is very doable to build a thirty million dollar company in Memphis. Is if you have a great idea, I mean it's not easy, but that's totally possible. So I think it's less about what does the ecosystem need and what should the ecosystem do and what do I want as a founder? If your heart is telling I mean, the, the one thing you need to have as a founder is listen to your gut and have a very, very strong gut that you trust. And if your gut's telling you, I have a great idea and I, I want to be in Memphis for my lifestyle, then like go in Memphis. And if it's consumer internet, do consumer internet. If you don't want to do a logistics company, don't do a logistics company because you feel like the ecosystem wants you to do a logistics company. I mean, no one was funding content companies when I started Pando. I mean, it's like a horrible business to fund. Um, so, you know, and now everyone is like piled in. They didn't quite realize it's a horrible business to fund. But like, you know, you've got to do what your heart tells you. We're running out of time here. I wanted to see any questions from the audience uh, right now. Um, feel free to either type them in or raise your hand and I can just relay them. Okay. Yeah, just what do you got? Um, no, I'm just wondering how she manages to balance her family life um, and the high powered career. Cool. So, so the question from Miss Caroline Ponsetti over here is how do you manage to balance a uh, family life and the type of high power career that you have? Any any tips on that? I know that's so many tips. Yeah. I, just, I think about this every day. <laughs> Probably write a third book on that. I know, I know. I'm so glad someone asked this question. It's become a passe question to ask, and so I never get asked it. And I'm like, I have so many thoughts. Um, so I um, so I raised money for Pando on maternity leave with Eli, and then six months into building the company, I got pregnant with my second child, Evie. And so for the first three years of the company, I was nursing her pregnant, which is insane. And I did not have a co-founder, so it was just me. Um, so I learned a lot. So it, and it forever shaped the culture of our company. So for one thing, you are forced to delegate way quicker. And one of the biggest problems that founders face is they want to control everything. And when it's your company, you can probably do every job in that company better than someone else, but when you're pregnant and about to go into labor or you have two young kids, like you just can't. And so you got to pick the things that, I mean, one of my big mentors has been Dick Costello from Twitter, who's a wonderful CEO and a wonderful person. And, you know, one of the pieces of advice he gave me early on was the CEO should be do only be doing things that only the CEO can do. And that's incredibly hard when you are a new first-time CEO or building a company because you want to control everything and do everything and micromanage and lead by example and just do it yourself, and you just can't. So we became a more mature organization way quicker because I couldn't do that. The other thing is, you know, TechCrunch was a company where everyone worked 24 hours a day. Everyone worked every weekend. It was a grueling culture. And a lot of Silicon Valley is that way, and people get really burned out. And this is one of the biggest reasons companies sell at you know a very young age because people just can't do it anymore, and they can't sustain the pace. And the culture is right. built on this treadmill that just like becomes very, very unwieldy. And so you know, early on, I just sort of had to accept that basically I couldn't work weekends. I mean, I don't even open my laptop on weekends. I am pretty much just with my kids, and I'm on my phone certainly. And if something big happens. But like even when my kids nap, like I usually nap on the weekends or I go to the gym or something. Like I don't work at all. And then during the week, I get up at like six. I spend the morning with the kids. Sometimes I'll take my son to school. I'll go work out after that. I'll work for about eight hours. I'll get home to rock them. I'll I always spend dinner with them and not always dinner, but I always come home to bathe them and rock them. And then if I have dinners or anything, I do them after eight o'clock when the kids have gone to bed. Um, so I just have these, like, I have a lot of structure. I have these built-in times in the day. Um, I work out more than I ever have because I have basically 10 hours a week I can, and so I make sure that I actually make it there. Otherwise, it's not happening. So, like, structure, ritual, that's really, really important when you're a working mom because it's also really, really good for the kids. But the good thing about it, I, I worried that because I couldn't work, 
24 hours a day, we wouldn't be very successful because the rest of your team won't work that schedule if you're not working that schedule and you kind of can't ask them to. But it actually has been the opposite. It has made us um, a place that people love to work and it makes you a place that can build a company for the long term, which is very much our goal. And again, we just did an interview with this company Slack, which is an incredibly hot company in the Valley right now. Um, and uh, Stuart, the, the founder, was saying that they have more 40-year-old and up engineers than any, any billion-dollar company and probably work the fewest number of hours per week. And he said, basically, at 6.30, this company is empty. And I've never heard a billion-dollar company say that in Silicon Valley. But there's a real recollection that this, like, treadmill of intensity is really a lot of, like, wasted cycles. If, if someone's coming from, you know, being in classes at Rhodes and they go to work for a startup in uh, the Valley, what's the biggest culture shock going to be then? What's the biggest difference in culture at one of those companies? Um, let me, God, that, ask me the other one first because let me think okay. about that. All right. Uh, let's see. i got to read the other one. Um, oh, yeah, okay. This is a good one. Um, do you think that if you're coming out of college and should – and you have aspirations to start a company at some point, do you think you should get a job before you go and start that company? Um, is that going to give you valuable experience and maybe a little bit more uh, you know, financial padding? Um, or should you just go straight into it, you know, the time is now type of thing? What do you think? So I think it totally depends on the person, totally depends on the opportunity. I mean, if you have, like, an amazing opportunity right now and you feel passionate about it, like, you should just go do it. Because, you know, the problem with getting a job is, if you're gonna, if you want to work in the industry, you want to disrupt. Sometimes you get too invested into that industry, and you kind of can't see it through fresh eyes. Yeah. Also, you go in and you think you're gonna build this financial cushion. That never happens. Like you want, you're making sixty thousand dollars, which is like a hell of a lot more than I made out of school as a writer. And like you're spending that money. I mean, you just don't build a financial cushion. So it's like if that's your reason, don't do it. Um, if it's you know to get some experience, there's certainly. Certainly, you are a better boss if you have worked for other bosses. So I think there's there's some of that that's valuable. Um, but I think it depends on the industry. I mean, if you're trying to disrupt something with fresh, young eyes, I think that it's valuable. For me, there's no way I could have done this company right out of school. I needed to work in media for 15 years and understand, you know, the art and craft of reporting and storytelling. And also, like... I needed to have been sued before. I needed to have been threatened before. I mean, we've had very, very scary things happen to us, and I've been able to have my reporters back because as a reporter, I'd gone through that, and I'd had editors who had had my back. So I think there are certain industries where having that job experience is so much more valuable. But, you know, again, the great thing about entrepreneurship is it's totally individualistic. So, like, listen to your gut. I mean, maybe the best experience you have is trying even if you fail. And let's see, culture shock. I think the culture shock will be how much free food there is everywhere. 